Hey, everybody. Welcome to our webinar, um, our first one in our series Behind the Tap Room. We've got um, Alagash is our first up today to show us uh, the behind the scenes at the in their QC lab. Um, so I'm really, really excited about this. So I'll tell you why in just a minute. Um, first, let me introduce myself. I'm Lucy Benedict. I am a chemistry professor at the University of Southern Maine. And I'm also the director of what I think is the coolest lab at USM, the Quality Control Collaboratory, or for much shorter, the QC2 lab. Um, I'm really excited for this event because Allagash was the first brewery that I ever got started working with after I shifted my work um, out of the environmental field and into uh, beer quality, which has been a fun transition. Um, the QC2 lab at USM, if you're not familiar with us, we're dedicated to supporting the brewing industry through testing, education, and research. Um, and all of that is done in this really cool educational experience for undergrads where they're doing the testing, they're helping with the webinars and the educational um, workshops that we do. And they're also doing research projects. Um, and if you join our next Behind the Tap Room series in February with Jax Abbey, you'll probably hear a little bit about that research project, one of the many that we've got going on with them. We've also been really lucky to do many with Zach here at Allagash. So um, that's been really exciting for us. It's a great opportunity for our students. Um, the lab is funded through all of those endeavors that um, people go through with the lab through the testing and the workshops. It's also funded through grants with the Maine Economic Improvement Fund, the EPA, and also the American Society of Brewing Chemists. So we're very fortunate to have that support. Um, I got to know Zach just about, oh my gosh, I don't even know. It feels like a long time ago when we started the lab, um, I took my students on a tour at Allagash that was an upper level chemistry lab. And we got talking about all of these really cool um, projects we could do together because I had all these instruments that I needed my students to learn how to use. They needed though like real world fun ways to use them, not cookbook labs. And Zach had a million ideas for how this could help the brewing industry. And that was just the start of what the QC2 lab is now. And so I'm super grateful for that experience. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Zach in just a minute. Zach is the quality manager at Allagash. Um, he's also on the QC2 advisory board. He's a member of the Maine Brewers Guild. He is so many more things than, than that. Um, He's also a really great guy, just all the time. Um, and the one of the, my favorite things about Zach is I have probably been on, I don't know how many tours of Allagash and the lab. And he not only makes them educational for me every time, but he's the most fun person. He gets so excited about science and beer that he excites me, he excites my students. So. Um, I'm sure that today's tour, even though virtual, will be really exciting. Um, so I'm going to sit back. I've got myself, as Zach recommended and donated to us, thank you very much, a fine acre to enjoy while I get to uh, see the lab again, and hopefully for many of you the first time. So Zach, I'm going to pass it over to you, and thank you so much for doing this. All right, I'll take it away. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Lucy, for having me. This is it's an honor to be a part of this QC2 program and to kick things off in this Behind the Tap Room series. So, um, yeah, Zach, I've been here at Allagash for about a dozen years now. Um, when I started here, you know, we were much smaller. Um, probably 20 people at the company. Everyone kind of did everything. So I did some brewing, some packaging, cellaring. folks out there, I'm sure. Uh, as we started to grow, we, we realized we needed to commit a little more labor towards uh, lab time, quality control kind of stuff, uh, mostly microbiology. And I was lucky to have enough uh, background um, in biology that I kind of drew the short stick there and we got to grow the program to where it is today. So as Lucy uh, mentioned, it's, it's come quite a long way since then. So. I'm excited to show you where we're at right now and kind of where we've been in the past. I'll tell you, um, 
with COVID protocols here. You should see our beautiful lab is a little bit empty. I have Mike B on in here with me. He's our microbiologist, uh, but he's the only other person in here with me right now. Typically we'd have this room filled with five of us. Um, we're not having five people in a small space right now, so we had to get creative with our, with our labor here. Um, so right now, it's only two people in at a time. If anyone comes out and anyone else comes in, it's only for an hour at most. So things are a little bit different. We have some people working from home, which we're lucky. Uh, those people are more on quality assurance side, data management side, things that they can do at home. But there's still a lot of hands-on things uh, that we need to do here to be present for us. So. Lucky for us, those are the things we're gonna be talking about today anyway. So I'll start kind of just, I'll give you our lab philosophy, you know, our, our major core quality initiatives here. And it kind of begins with consumer safety. You know, that's the number one priority for us. We want our consumers to be safe while they drink the beer. So that, you know, if someone has a sour Allagash White, that's a huge bummer, but it's not going to harm them. If someone has an overpressurized package, four and a half CO2 volumes, and it explodes on their, in their car, in their fridge, on their table, that could potentially hurt them quite a bit. So that's our number one concern. And for, bear with me here, I haven't given a tour for about 10 months. And I've never given a Zoom tour, so I'm gonna do the best I can. Um, with package integrity, it starts firstly with just the supplier, right? So we're we're getting glass from a supplier, and we're subject to their quality for the most part. We can have. Uh, packaging operators inspecting the glass on the way into the infeed. We can have inline instrumentation, inline x-rays, monitoring the integrity of that glass, but ultimately, you know, it's not impossible for uh, a hazardous glass to get through and out to the market. So besides those things, our biggest line of defense in that respect is traceability, lot tracing. So that's kind of where that data management piece comes in. So for the most part, that's not something we're dealing with out here. The packaging line is really carefully looking at those lots, logging them correctly, it's going into the database that we can bring up easily. So we know what lot of glass was used, what day, what year, what part of the run, and we can get that information quickly if necessary. Hopefully not, but the other side of package integrity is, you know, over pressurization of the package I and mean, that's something we worry about quite a bit that could be due to uh, wild yeast uh, wild yeast saccharomyces cerevisiae variant diastaticus it could be due to an error on our end in bottle conditioning we do a ton of bottle conditioning and we also use a ton of different yeasts and lots of different wild fruits a lot of different sugars. There's a lot of ways we can really kind of uh, look at the integrity of our package. So we have to be really careful with that. So I'll start just with that bottle conditioning process. So how are we careful with bottle conditioning? Well, we know we know the extract prior to dosing in extra yeast and extra sugar. Just like Lucy has in her lab, we have this. Anton Parr alkalizer, which if you don't know, it's really just a super precise, super accurate hydrometer. It tells us the alcohol and the amount of extract at a very precise level in the beer. So before we package that beer, we're gonna take a sample there. We're gonna use that number in a calculation to figure out how much sugar needs to be added to that beer. Um, so if we wanna bring the CO2 volumes up from 1.3 CO2 volumes, get it up to 3.5, we're gonna need quite a bit of sugar. Um, we also need yeast. To, to calculate that, we also need to know the potential over attenuation 
the bad beer. So a lot of these wild beers, maybe they haven't fermented out all the way yet. So we have to do forced fermentations ahead of time. So when you put all that information together, I'll share my screen here with you real quick. Hopefully you can see that. Lucy, let me know when you can see that screen. We can see it, it looks great. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, if you wanna present it too, then it'll be bigger for everybody. Do that. I could get lost in buttons too. Perfect. Okay, here we go. You see that now? All right. Chemistry. Yay. How about that? Consumer safety, analytical chemistry. Here we go. So this is just a good visual of what I'm talking about. I can get a little bit wordy and the uh, graph will help me articulate here. But if you look at the bottle conditioning graph and you look at the y-axis, you see a change in real extract there. And on the x-axis is basically just time. So if you look at the x-axis, you see terminal extract. That's where a beer's extract is prior to being dosed. Dosed extract, that's the extract we add in for bottle conditioning. And then, you know, if you look at the yellow line, that's Allagash White. That's typical Allagash White. We add dosed extract, and, you know, by three weeks later, it has consumed all that extract. Nothing more, nothing less. That's a good thing. That's successful bottle conditioning. If you look at, I think it's a red line, it's the other line, dangerous looking line. This is a graph of something that happened back in 2015 with a very complex uh, beer called Allagash 4. Allagash 4 is called Allagash 4 because there are four yeast strains used. There are four different types of sugar used throughout the fermentation, uh, four hops, four malts. We don't make it anymore. Uh, but this is a, a good example of things that can go wrong. You can see at terminal extract, we're at six Play-Doh-ish. We dosed in for bottle conditioning, but upon conditioning, that yeast consumed the sugar that we added and so much more that was still left in the under fermented beer. So much so that three weeks later, the CO2 was up to 4.4 volumes and even almost five volumes. Uh, a little bit later. So at that point, you're reaching pretty dangerous levels of CO2, and we, we need to avoid that. But that's why we do it. And we do, we monitor these fermentations, fermentations for every every brand, every beer that comes off the line, whether it's 12 ounce or 375s or 750 mil corking cages, they're getting a pretty close extract monitoring. So along with the extract monitoring, we're also looking at CO2 production over the same amount of time. So we have an at pack CO2 number. We know where the CO2 is as soon as we put the beer in. We have a one week, two week, three week, six week, 12 week, 24 week, and so on and so on. Um, to make sure that we can catch ourselves if there's too much CO2 being produced and we can catch ourselves if not enough CO2 is being produced. Uh, a lot of times these if you're not familiar with Allagash, we do a pretty wide range of uh, lactic acid beers or wild beers using wild yeast and lactic acid bacteria. That environment can be pretty harsh on a uh, re-fermentation yeast. So over the years, we've had a few issues. We've gotten a lot better, uh, but when those fermentations don't work out, we know right away. And sometimes there's just nothing you can do about it. Um, and to look at CO2, we have this, if you look behind me here, this is a CO2 laser, essentially. So it's from Pent Air. It's pretty cool. It's adjustable. And what you can do is take any size bottle, whether it's small or large, convert it a few times, throw it up here. You see that tablet and then you just hit go on the tablet it's going to fire an infrared laser through that headspace and using that 
pressure inside the bottle. And on the side, we can still get the temperature of the bottle. So using those two uh, variables, we know how much CO2 is potentially in the bottle. In this case, it's probably around three. Um, and we can do that with any bottle. The bummer is, you know, that's cool technology, but we've recently started canning a lot more too. And the laser does not go through the cans. So we're back to the primitive days of you know, that Zamenagel shaker, probably looks familiar to most. Um, we're doing a lot of shaking as well. A time. Okay. Um, also, consumer safety. So we talked about package integrity. Um, other things that could cause, like I said, is wild yeast. So what are we doing to detect wild yeast in here? We have microbiology, of course, and also PCR technology. So we want to find wild yeast, and it's pretty difficult because it looks just like the rest of our Belgian Saccharomyces strains. So the only real way to do it, we can start to differentiate using cupric sulfate, and we'll do that in LCSM media, and also, I guess, an LCSM broth. And I will share my screen once again so you guys can see a good picture of this. If you're not familiar with it. All right, so here's a good picture. Lucy, you see that okay? Yes, coming through. All right, awesome. So on the very far left, you see two 50 mil falcon tubes. You can see a green liquid. That's basically just uh, YMB or yeast malt broth. And we add in a portion of cupric sulfate to knock out any strains that aren't resistant to cupric sulfate. So mostly looking for STA1 positive strains. That's a pretty good initial indicator. So if a yeast is growing in the solution, we know that it's either partially uh, resistant or completely resistant to the presence of cupric sulfate. On the left, you see that is well behaved. There's no CO2 forming. On that right falcon tube, you see a lot of bubbles. You see a lot of haze. That's a pretty clear indicator that there's a yeast strain growing that is very much resistant. So that's bad news. But you know, you pull that out and you look under the scope, you can't tell if it's actually diastaticus or has the STA1 gene present. Um, I'll stop there for a second. I think most people on this call probably are aware of this wild yeast uh, diastaticus. But if you aren't, it's a it's it's a strain that is it has a gene that can produce uh, an enzyme that breaks down complex sugars. So you know, say Allagash White, you're left with 2.5 Play-Doh uh, worth of extract in the beer, or two Play-Doh. You know, our yeast can't take it any further than that. But if a diastatic strain was present, it could take it down to one, almost all the way down to zero. So that would be bad news um, in terms of CO2 production. So that's something we want to avoid. This is one of the ways we do it. If you look in the upper middle section, you'll see LCSM. And this is this in a, this is um, Lens Cooper Media. Yeah, Lens Cooper. Like I said, it's been a while since I talked about this stuff, but you don't want to see colonies growing on this because if they do grow, again, they're just resistant to that cupric sulfate. Um, this is just an example of different uh, cell concentrations, 330 and 300 cells. So even just using plate media and certainly using broth, you, you're very capable of catching the small concentration of, of wild yeast coming through. But like you said, we cannot, confirm the presence of SA1 with media. So you need the PCR technology. I don't know if this hidden on my screen, but you see the, the little R2 unit on the right. It's the MyGo Pro. That's a nice open source PCR machine that we can use. In the lab. So when we do find the presence of that yeast growing, we have to look at it genetically as well. Kind of setup is right over here, and I'm realizing I'm still sharing my screen. But 
um, using that PCR technology. Don't tell me now. Dell. Oh, it's all hidden. So here in the lab is where we're at. So a little bit of time in this unit, a little bit of time underneath the PCR hood, uh, we can have confirmed genetic results of the SDA1 gene within an hour and a half or so. So if we do see something growing in that media, we'll extract the DNA and get it running right away. Um, and that's kind of our final check on that. So since this is a tour, I'll, kind of, I'll bring you over slowly as to not give you vertigo. Not only to see Mike again, but to look in the incubator. This is our incubator here. Loaded with all kinds of good stuff. And then here's proof that we're doing our LCSM broth testing. See those little tubes? Luckily, no positives to show you here. All clear. That's good news. And also, if you start looking down low, we have our aerobic LCSM plates. And lucky, nothing good to show you there. So we're safe right now. Beyond that, and I'm sure maybe some of you will have questions about PCR later, uh, we can move on to our next tier of, you know, our next tier of quality initiative. That's what we're doing for consumer safety. Is this a good time to take some questions? Well, so far, no questions, but I, I remembered after I passed the mic over to you that I didn't even tell people the housekeeping rules is that you can ask questions. So that's an important piece, right? So um, for all of you, hope you're enjoying this so far. I know I am. Um, if you want to ask a question at any time, please type it into the Q&A um, box that you see. And then any open questions that we have, um, if they're immediate, I'll, I'll throw them right at Zach while he's talking. And, and if they're not, we'll save them for the end. But this is your chance to ask Zach anything QC related to beer. So, um, oh, we got one. Yay. Um, okay, so we've got this question. What are two or three things a small brewery can do for QC with a limited budget for lab equipment? Sorry, I lost my volume a little bit here. One sec. I don't know, no problem. Name one or two thing, two or three things a small brewery can do to do what? It says, what are two or three things a small brewery can do for, oh, sorry. What are two or three things a small brewery can do for QC with a limited budget for lab equipment? That's, Oh, that's the biggest layup all time. Mm -hmm. um, I will say we do have a webinar coming up on the 11th of February at noon with um, two other brewers who are going to talk to us about exactly that, how they started their QC program, um, how to do it, how to start for free with no money at all, no lab, um, and then how to build it. So, so we've got that if you really want to dive deep into that, but I know Zach's got some really good info on that. Yeah, so, so right off the bat, um, QC2 is obviously putting uh, this webinar on right now, but they also have uh, a great, they're a fantastic resource for simple media to, to start out in the brewery. So we haven't got into it yet, but we're going to talk about lactic acid bacteria media very shortly here. Um, QC2 can help you out with that. You don't even have to make it yourself. They'll make it up, send it to you. You do your your analysis and send back the tubes and fall off, you're done. Um, no time to make media, it's just, it's really convenient and you don't have to deal with the disposal of uh, that nasty stuff. Uh, two, I just showed you that liquid uh, LCSM broth that's so cheap to make and it's probably the most important thing you can do micro-wise is try to prevent over attenuation in your packages, that'll kill you. So. Um, all that together, I can probably make a liter of that liquid LCSM for under $2, under $3. So um, that's a really inexpensive way to do. So I'd start with 
looking for wild yeast and definitely stay tuned for that next webinar. A good segue. Um, next, let's get into our second tier, consumer safety. All right, that's worst case scenario, consumer gets hurt. Uh, number two, we want everyone who's drinking our beer to have that ultra premium experience, right? We don't want we don't want someone to pay, you know, 12 bucks for a four pack of Allagash White and then, you know, it's, it's, the beer is flat or the beer is sour or it's light struck or we don't want anything wrong with that beer at all. Um, if they do find something wrong, there's a lot of other beer that they can drink and they're not going to come back and purchase a four pack of Allagash White. So we want it to be the best it can possibly be every single time um, unspoiled. So that really digs into, you know, firstly, something that would turn someone away is having a, a, a micro, microbial contamination. And that's where a lot of uh, labs start as well. You want to be able to detect lactic acid producing bacteria in your brewery as quickly as possible, isolate it as quickly as possible and identify it as quickly as possible if you can. So to do that, it's, it's kind of back to microbiology here. Um, at Allagash, we make really yeasty beer a lot of the time. Um, with all that yeast and solution, it can be pretty tricky to knock out and find any small lactic acid bacteria that may be in there. So we'll, we'll pop open this incubator one more time and take a look. Uh, microbiology, we want to test as early as possible and as often as possible. And there's different media you can use for anything that you're looking for. I'm gonna kind of go fast because I'm realizing I'm going a little long-winded, but if we look here, uh, like our liquid LCSM, this is MRS, uh, Mangarosa. We're looking for lactic acid spoilers there. So day one in fermentation, we're gonna take a sample out of the fermenter spin it down in a centrifuge uh, to get the big solids out very quickly. And we're going to top it off with this enrichment broth. After a week, we're going to decant most of it and top it off again. That enrichment broth has a antibiotic called cyclohexamide in it. And that's gonna knock out any of the happy yeast. If yeast was growing in that, we would not be able to find any lactic acid spoilers. So. Step one, knock out the yeast to give yourself the best chance to find something that could be there. That's a really good option. Um, the bummer with MRS is that, you know, a lot of different things can grow in there beyond just beer spoilers. So a lot of hygienic spoilers can, can start growing in there too. So you want to be able to uh, proof outgrowth with a microscope and PCR if possible. So we do that at day one for fermentation. We also do it again at terminal gravity. So when the beer comes down, we start chilling the tank. Uh, after that, we push the beer into a conditioning tank and we're going to start looking uh, a little more closely. There's a little less yeast. These are anaerobic chambers, so we can put these plates in these chambers, put in a little sachet. That's going to strip out any oxygen. Most of the beer spoilers we're looking for will grow in, without the presence of oxygen much, much better. These happen to be streak plates. So after it passes the MRS check, before we dump it, we'll actually streak it out on this media to make sure it's definitely negative. Um, but we also have the membrane filtration plates here as well. You'll see a couple of those plates are pretty, have some material on them. It looks dangerous, but it's really not. For us, we have a lot of solids in our beer. Um, so that's really just some proteins and yeast hanging out on top. If we do have any lactic acid production, that blue color will turn fluorescent green and we'll know that we need to do a little more digging there. So they'll stay in there a week and we'll pull them out and be done with that. Um, along with WLD, this is HLP. This is what most breweries start out with in terms of media. And for us, it's still, it's still a, a major component of our micro program. 
if it grows in HLP, you should be very scared. Um, you know, like I was saying with the MRS, some stuff will grow in there. You don't have to worry about if it's growing in HLP. You know you have a problem. However, you're you're only looking at one to three mils of beer at a time per sample. Whereas with these tubes, you can look at 50 mils per sample. And depending on the the amount, the, the haziness, the proteins in the solution in a beer, the suspended solids, you can get anywhere from 10 to 200 mils through those membrane filtration plates. So HLP, you're limited by sample size, but you make up for it in knowing how dangerous things are. Hey, Zach, we got a good question coming in. Um, yeah. Question is, do you also streak onto plates and clean them uh, aerobically? Yes, but not WLD. Good question. So if we look down. Oh, you're frozen. Near LCSM. Bottom row here. We have. I see some growth there. That later. Um, we'll 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 uh, streak out our four squirt samples, mostly on McConkie auger to look for gram negatives. Uh, with the LMDA, we'll do more water water samples and also the work samples. Actually, I'm sorry, it's been a while since I did micro, but we're we're streaking out the four squirt samples on both. McConkie and LMDA, and those are aerobic. And a lot of times with the aerobic stuff, if you're testing water, you'll see some inherent water bacteria. I got nothing interesting to show you here, unfortunately. But yeah, we do some aerobic streaking as well. Nice. Now another question came in is, uh, when using membrane filtration, do you extract yeast before running through the filter? And if so, um, is this done using centrifuge? Yeah, great question. Um, no, we don't take the yeast out. Uh, we get as much of sample through as we can, and then we, we call it quits. That's why some, you know, with, if it's Allagash White, we may only be able to get 20 mils through. But if it's something like house beer, we'll get up to 50 to 60 mils through. Nice. But Here's yeah. I got another question for you. Do you prefer um, to use WLD or MRS for acetic lactic, uh, for acid lactic bacteria detection? Great question. Um, I will be completely honest with you in saying that the acetic acid spoilers are a little more hygienic. Um, in the brewery setting and beer, you know, for most of these beers, they're they're knocked out into the fermenter from the brew house. And then within seven to 11 days, they're turned down and ready to package. Um, within that time frame, there's very little oxygen present. So it's mostly CO2 production, scrubbing out all the oxygen. So there's really not a huge opportunity for those acetic spoilers to show up. Where you do run into the trouble is like I was just showing you the four sort samples. So Pulling, when I say four squirt samples, it means we're taking samples uh, from the first knockout into every tank on the backside of the heat exchanger. So the wort leaves the brew house, goes through the heat X, chills down very quickly, and the brewers collect the sample there. Theoretically, there should be no growth in that sample whatsoever, whether it's our, our house yeast or anything else. If anything is growing, it gives us a signal that our heat exchanger could be not as clean as we hope it is. So that's where you might see some acetic spoilers showing up as well, which is why we have, and I said McConkie auger, a lot of gram negative spoilers will we'll be very happy on that media and nothing else grows. Excellent. Cool. All right. So again, you know, any of those positive results, actually, I think I do have some positive results for you. Let's look in the fridge. This is not the incubator, but it's the fridge. And 
What you don't want to see in your HRP, I don't know if you can see that. You see little white colonies in there? You kind of can. Sorry, the lighting is kind of bad in here. There it is. Yeah. See, that's bad. That's a pretty good indicator that you either have lactobacillus or pediococcus species growing. And at that point, you're pretty screwed. But it's not a guarantee. So we do have a molecular program there as well. So for the PCR, if we see growth on any of that uh, lactic spoiler media, we're still going to run it through PCR to determine whether A, it is actually lactobacillus, pediococcus, echinodus, and any of them all. Um, but that's our final check. And of course, if we do find something, we're going to retest it a bunch of times for confirmation. I know I just breezed through our micro program very quickly. So some more questions, but I kind of feel like I should just keep rolling for a minute. Of course, if you have more to say, if people have questions, fill them in, but um, yeah. All right, great. Um, in, in more terms of, you know, providing consumers that ultra premium experience. Again, we're looking at, you know, not dangerous levels of CO2, but we want to be within our CO2 specs. So, like I said, for, for every packaging run we do, we're looking at extract before, CO2 before, uh, dosing, after dosing, and throughout the re-fermentation process to make sure we're right in spec there. Um, and lastly, on the ultra premium experience tier, our sensory program is huge. So with sensory, I would say out of all the panels that we have, our true to type program is incredibly important for uh, maintaining that consumer experience. We've been, yeah, right now is a different story during COVID and so our sensory program has changed a little bit, but in normal days we have 40 trained panelists tasting every beer that's being released out of the warehouse. So it's, we have a pretty good grip on, on, on the beer leaving. And then of that last year, we get the consumer safety. We have ultra premium experience. We have consistency, number three, you know. The beer isn't dangerous, it's not spoiled. Now we wanna make sure it tastes the same time after time. That's branch, it's brewery leaving for the day. Um, and for that, we're kind of in analytical chem land once again, you know, it's for consumer safety, but also for consistency. We're brewing with new lots of raw materials more and more. The bigger we get, the more lots of pops we're getting in, the more lots of uh, base malts. We're using local base malts that are changing lots pretty quickly uh, and, and, you know, malts from around the world, really. So as we're changing, these raw materials, we want to make sure that our beer doesn't change. So most commonly right now, we're doing um, IBU testing on finished beer routinely, just to make sure that our, the, the alphas we get reported are actually where they should be. And, you know, work color is very important to us when you look at Allagash uh, White, super, super pale, any amount of small amount of dark malt or even a change in one, one and a half SRM is going to change that beer from Allagash White to Allagash Orange pretty quickly. So we monitor work color very closely. Also for consistency, um, there's a few other analytical methods we run from time to time. Um, we have some starch methods that we use when we're playing around in the brew house. Uh, but other than that, um, we have some good friends over at QC2 that will get into analytics for us. And, you know, we, we have some cool equipment here in the lab at Allagash, but we don't have the GCMS and we don't have that kind of stuff. Oops. I mean, we don't really have a need to have it here, honestly, but it's super cool to have it within arm's reach. And we can do either research or get baselines or it's nice to have at our fingertips, certainly. So consistency wise, that's where we're at. Um, I didn't talk about haze. It is not the sexiest thing we do in the Allagash lab. However, haze is super critical to what we're doing here. 
haze stability in Allagash White. You'll see a couple of haze meters here, Hawk 2100N, um, and the Seagrass Lab Scat. We'll look at uh, haze stability in white over time using those instruments. But I know we're, we're on the tail end here. I haven't covered everything I probably should have. Um, I guess one last fun thing to talk about before we go into questions, if there are questions, would be our yeast propagation program. Um, you know, one of the things that give us confidence in our own yeast prop program is uh, the in-house, you know, having PCR in-house, having a really tight micro program. So look here, this is our orbitable, orbital shaker table. Sorry, this is a mirrored screen here. And that's just what's on deck today. Um, you'll see a variety of some experiments going on, trying to uh, harvest wild yeast from the environment. You'll see some propagations happening. You see some forced attenuations happening, like I was talking about uh, before we fall condition in those wild beers. Um, any given day, we probably have five to six different propagations going. Um, and if you look down on the floor, let's see. That's YB6, that's a yeast spring for us. So that's a, just a prop vessel that will, this is actually organic. You get into that organic gam. You guys saw Lucy drinking Fine Acre. That beer presented a whole new list of challenges for us. Um, lots of regulations in place for producing organic beer. That could be a, a whole other webinar. Um, however, I'm going to keep showing you this stuff. Please. So this is our negative 80 degree freezer. And this is where we start our bank. So look inside here. It's very, very cold. We have lots of one hand holding up a Dell, the other trying to open cryovials. All right, we're on it. So here's a 1.8 mil cryovial. It's like a Belgian Saison yeast. Um, that's kind of where it starts, top wise. But before it goes into this cryo freezer, we've already done extensive microbiology on it. We've done a ton of QC checks. So we know that it's free of wild yeast. We know it's free of lactic acid producing bacteria before it even goes in here. As we pull it out to continue propagation, I'll grab the plate for you. We're still doing all our quality checks. We're giving it more. We're testing it on media. We're running it on PCR throughout its life. So. There's a yeast plate. When we start prop, we'll pull from that cryo. We'll streak it out onto these plates. Um, incubate it for a few days till we get nice colonies like this. We isolate those colonies. And then we step it up into 10 mils of yeast small broth. This is Matt. He's one of our brewers. Hello. It's the world. Uh, all over the world, man. Oh, nice. Yeah. So here's a 10 mil. So from that plate, we'll take three colonies or so for some genetic diversity, plop it into 10 mils of broth, give that another two days, step it up into 100 mils, like you see on the table. These guys. From 100, it'll go into a liter. Here. From a liter, it'll go maybe into four liters here, maybe uh, into a kettlebell. So we don't have Carlsberg flasks, but we kind of produced our own or had them made for us. These are uh, 20 liter stainless steel flasks held together with brewery fittings, tri clamps, really convenient spray balls, aeration lance, pressure gauge. Uh, pressure relief valve. These have been pretty great. So we do this for huge props as an intermediate step between the lab and production. So from this 11 liters, we'll 
prop up maybe five barrels of wort to inoculate a much bigger batch. Uh, mostly for white beer, it's the only yeast that we are routinely cropping and repitching. Uh, we crop and repitch our house yeast probably up to seven times, and we'll have three or four trees going at any given time. And that's from there, it's going on production. It's a new world. So I think I'll pause here as there's it's 450. I don't know how we're doing. Sorry, I feel like I jumped around a little bit. But. No, that was great. So many things going on in there. Um, so what questions does everybody have? And I know sometimes it takes a little while to type them in and, and think of them. So I, in the past webinars, I just ask really bad questions for a while until people get tired of hearing them and then they just start asking questions. But um, uh, one thing I was thinking of is like, there's so many things in your lab. I'm curious, what's on your wish list? Like, like if you were to give like Rob and Jason your Christmas list for next year, what would be top on it for the lab? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I just showed you those yeast propagation vessels. Um, one of them is brand new. Uh, it just came in earlier this week. Uh, it's really going to help us as we ramp up through the spring months into summer, have enough yeast. So timing was good there. We actually have a local company, Zajac, build that for us. And I, we ordered it probably eight months ago. And it's supposed to take six to seven weeks, but it turns out uh, they put that project on hold to help with vaccine production. Like, I guess that's important too. So they they're involved in a pretty big project with uh, vaccines. So it got kicked down the road a little bit, and it timed out well because you know beer production is a little bit slower in these winter months. So yeah. A question came in actually about those when using the Carlsberg container or the prop vessel on the floor is agitation used in these vessels. Good question. The one on the floor. No, it's not. Um, if you look behind me here. There's that vessel. Um, this uh -oh, I'm trying to like look at the screen. Uh, we have compressed air coming through regulated. So we're not using oxygen on these. We're using compressed air and we're running a sterile filter and lines to make sure we're not introducing anything we don't want. Um, these larger props, these are not agitated, um, but there is a little forced agitation with that uh, compressed air going through. So it's stirring things up a little bit, not like a mechanical paddle would do by any means, but we're getting some turn there. On the stainless yeast vessels down there, we actually plop those right up on the table and we hook it up to the same uh, compressed air device. So that is constantly agitated. And Zach, another question that came in, what are your tips for starting yeast propagation in house? Yeah, good question. Um, I'd say step one, make sure you have some confidence with your, your micro program. Um, you know, the most important thing is making sure that you're not propagating anything but that one species of yeast you want to be propagating uh, as you come up along the way. So you want to be able to screen out any presence of uh, lactic spoilers or wild yeast. So having those things is in place is paramount. The actual act of cropping yeast isn't isn't rocket science at all. You know, it's it's pretty cheap media. We use a blend of um, you small broth and depending on what we're going to be fermenting, if we're fermenting uh, wort, we'll, we'll add a lot of a portion of maltose. If we're just fermenting sugar that we dosed into a beer, we will add sucrose because there's no need to be introducing maltose at that point. So um, pretty inexpensive. Um, and there's a lot of good papers and, and presentations available on resources like uh, Master Brewers Association of America, get you started. Um, ASBC, maybe, uh, Pro Brewer. And there's just a lot of brewers that would be happy to help you, 
help you get started as well if you're interested. So reaching out to your peers. Yeah. Uh, next question for you. The inline sterile air filters that used on the prop vessel, is a new one prepped in autoclave for every run? Yes. Yeah, they're 0.2 micron filters. We've kind of used them longer than I've been here uh, for our O2 tanks that we have um, for aerating work coming out of the brew house or oxygenating work coming out of the brew house. Yeah, they're kind of one and done, which is a bummer, but it's pretty high risk if something were to, to happen to them, so. Absolutely. Mm. Next question, uh, what prompted you guys to use YMB for your yeast propagation as opposed to DME? Yeah, good, that's a very good question. DME seems perfect because it's pretty cheap and um, widely available. Our, our, it's also inherently messy. It's, it produces a lot of solids when autoclaved and boiled. Um, the YMB is just a little cleaner for us. We, we like to use that, but there's no reason you could not use DME. In fact, the organic prop that we have going on the floor right now, there's no organic YMB or any of that. So we have to get creative and grease uh, malting actually produces an organic dry and liquid malt extract that we use for those organic crops as a source of sugar. Excellent. Right. I love when people ask questions. I have no idea what I'm saying out of my mouth, like, but I'm glad you do because all the acronyms. Dry malt extract is what they meant by DNA. So. Oh yeah. Okay. Got that. I know that. When you're first starting homebrew with you just boil it up and mm -hmm. add some pellets and you're good to go. Nice. All right. What other questions do people have? Oh, there's one. Hold on. Okay, here we go. There's some new automated yeast cell counters out there, including one that's only $1,500. Are these accurate and worth it or do you just count manually? Yeah. You know, I had a really cool thing is our lab is actually working with a local um, startup company who's working on some technology to count yeast. Um, so that would be really fun as we uh, grow and work with people. But it's just a caveat. Fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, I, I don't think I'm familiar with what that technology is. Uh, we do. We have a microscope in here. It's mostly to look at growth that's popping up on media. We're not doing manual cell counts often if at all. We do have automatic cell counters. So out in production um, is actually where most of the cell count happens because we're, we're using cell counts for many, many different reasons in our, in our process out in production. And we do have, we have two automated cell counters from Nexalom, the cellometer or cello meter as we call them. Um, and it's been wonderful. It's wonderful because it takes a layer of subjectivity. So essentially you have a computer counting cells rather than a human. So your biggest variability comes between sample prep rather than what someone calls a cell and someone doesn't call a cell. And when you have 20 different production workers taking cell counts, it can uh, reduce that variability quite a bit. So we've actually had that technology for quite a few years at this point, probably eight, eight, nine years, we've done some automated cell counts. But I'm interested in the $1,500 ones. <laughs> Send a link to Lucy. Yeah. Um, Zach, another question came up. What is your favorite and or most used piece of equipment in the lab? <laughs> I'll tell you, I can tell you. That's actually easy. Um, the alkalizer. The Anton Parr meter and alkalizer. And it's not the fanciest piece of equipment that we own, but as far as a troubleshooting instrument, it's it's everything to us. It, it can tell us so much by running one sample. We can, we know the ethanol contents, we know real apparent extracts, calculated original extract. So when you start to compare samples and and you have a baseline of what a certain brand should be 
or if throughout a packing run, say you're producing Allagash Curio and you're packaging it, <clears throat> you're at the beginning of the run, looks great. It was this amount of extract, um, this amount of ethanol. Towards the tail end of the run, we notice that the ethanol went down or the extract went down. We know that maybe there was some, there wasn't enough mixing in the dosing process. That could happen. You could have, and this has happened. And honestly, Lucy, I've been thinking about trying to put together a presentation just on the troubleshooting uh, uses for the density meter. But we had one case where years and years and years ago, our brewmaster was home and he had pulled out a 750 Acuria to share with his wife. And it was like, flat. This one bottle was flat and it just it didn't taste like curio like it should be. Um, so we brought it in and we, we looked at the data. We had all the data to show that, oh, at the beginning of the run, everything looked good. Middle of the run, everything looked good. And everything looked good. Like what time was this bottle taken? Um, and it turned out we looked back at the timestamp and things that were going on on the packaging line at that time. We had gone from bypassing the heat exchanger. Um, since our beer is bottle conditioned, when we package it, we bring it from cold to slightly warm, so it takes off fermentation quickly. We had done the first half without the heat exchanger. Then we switched to using the heat exchanger at one point. What happened was someone didn't flush out the heat exchanger water. So we actually had a period, a very short period, of diluted beer with water. So we could tell all that, one, by having good uh, timestamps and, and good quality assurance measures there, but two, by running the bottle. Like the ethanol was way down, the extract was way down, just made no sense. It was very clear that it was diluted beer. And it's the answer to everything, right? All these bottle conditioning problems I started showing at the beginning. Um, most people here are probably also familiar with hopcrete. Uh, we never would have. Uh, figured out hop creep at the start of that, you know, back in 2016, 2017, all that research was coming out pretty rapidly. Um, you know, we'd look on that alkalizer, we'd look at our re-fermentation data every day. So we had one beer that we dry hopped and re-fermented and it just attenuated way beyond free dose numbers. And we said, man, there's a lot of extra sugar being added. Where's it coming from? So the alkalizer. Nice. That was surprising to me. I thought it'd be something <laughs> else, but you know, I totally agree with you. It's, it's such a powerful instrument. And the other thing that I love about it in our lab is it's really, really easy to use. So powerful and easy to use is awesome. Absolutely. Any last questions from our, um, our audience? I know we're getting up to five or a little past five, um, but I guess if there's any last questions, shoot them in the Q&A. I'll just make a couple plugs. Thank you so much, Zach, for doing this for us. Our first lab tour behind the scenes, which is really exciting. Um, not easy, especially, <laughs> I just appreciate it so much. A um, couple of things just for all of you out there that we have coming up in the lab. We've got some really targeted workshops coming up on yeast counting, how to start your QC2 lab, diastaticus, actually with Mike from Allagash and Sam White, my lab coordinator, they'll be running the show for that one. Um, so check us out at qc2.beer. We got a new events page that looks really awesome too that just launched yesterday. So um, lots of things on there. Um, and if you don't have an alkalizer, you can send samples to the lab too. We've got one, happy to run your samples. Um, <laughs> I think this is the best question to end with, but what's your favorite Allagash beer? Oh man, that's, it's actually not that hard. Obviously Allagash White is probably a bit of a pinnacle beer for my enjoyment and sentimental reasons, of course. But uh, beyond that, if we look at our, our other stuff, um, it's tough. I love uh, some of the stuff coming out of the wild program, probably Belfius, which was a blend of spontaneous beer and our Saison. 
Um, that got really sparkly. That was a fun one to alkalize along the way. And it got up to probably five and a half CO2 volumes, but those smaller packages can take it, those split champagne bottles. So uh, that's probably my favorite besides white. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We have recorded this, so we'll be popping it up on our YouTube channel once uh, it goes through a little bit of editing to make sure everything matches up. Um, and then we'll send a link out to everybody, all of our attendees, so they can view it and we'll post it on our website um, so everybody can see it there. But if anybody has questions, feel free to shoot the lab an email. And if we can't answer it, we'll send it to Zach because he'll be able to. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure and an experience. It's been a while since I gave a tour, <laughs> never since I gave the Zoom tour. So thanks for being with me. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, bye everybody.